So at this point, you, you've got a co-working space, yep. so you've got a place for people to gather, right? You've brought in a million cups, which is a great program, right, mm -hmm. to, to get people there. I imagine getting the word out in a place like Peoria is probably pretty easy, right? So what, what do you feel like was the biggest challenge y'all faced in just starting this whole thing and getting people interested in it? Uh, or was there a lot of interest right out the bat? I think there was a lot of interest from the entrepreneurial community, and then it was a huge, and I know this is still the case in a lot of cities, of education curve for the traditionalists, if yeah. you will. I'm putting them in air quotes too, right? The traditionalists, the, the government folks, the institutional folks of, what does this mean? You know, what are you talking about? Like the terminology, all those types of things was all foreign to everyone. Yeah. Um, they knew commercialization. They didn't know anything about building a startup. No, they knew, yeah, they knew tech transfer, commercialization, yeah. all those types of things. But yeah, they didn't, like, what's a business model canvas? I don't know what that is. Right. Um, yeah, like those exits, uh, series A, you know, seed round, the investment terms, incubators, accelerators, right? Like, it was a huge education thing. And I was, I mean, myself and then the other folks that were helping run the nonprofit, we had a board of uh, nine people. We were all kind of, I mean, we were all learning, but we were exposed to it yeah. all the time. So we were knowledgeable on it, able to talk about it, you know, educate people. But that was the hardest part was getting, I don't say the money, yeah. but to sustain it over time, getting people, you, you can't just run it for free. Well, we'll talk about that. I have done it for free for a long time. <laughs> you shouldn't run it for free, yeah. um, but getting people on board and educated to be willing to give you money. Yeah. was tough because you had your traditional organizations, you had your chamber, you had your regular EDC, you had your nonprofits, you had all these organizations that were all vying for a very yeah. small pool of philanthropic dollars. So how do you stand out and say, hey, what we're doing is the most important, you know, or right. from an economic perspective, so. Well, and you you were a pioneer and there, I mean, we had Trey Bowles here in Dallas, right? Yeah. He was doing something very similar, mm -hmm. right? And there were a group of y'all that were kind of connected throughout the U.S. That, you know, Brad and Ian hadn't really come out with their right. their Boulder thesis yet. They were still building that community. They had started a couple of years earlier, but they still hadn't had that, mm -hmm. you know, big epiphany. Right. So you're kind of operating in the dark. Did that scare a bunch of people in the community? Like you, y'all don't even know what you're doing. I think for a while until Brad's book came out. Okay. Until the first startup community's book came out. It was yeah. interesting you mentioned that because the people that the, the consultants they brought in to do the uh, asset based economic development, they were meeting with me separately and they said, Hey, have you heard of Startup Communities <laughs> by Brad Feld? I was yeah. like, No, I no. haven't. Yeah. I read it and I'm like, Oh my gosh, somebody understands what I'm trying to do. Like yeah. they've actually put pen to paper and talked about what we're trying to do here. So that book became like the Bible, right? Yeah. Of, here's somebody else that's done it. They kind of laid it all out. You know, go read this. Here's what we're doing. Um, that type of thing. So it was it was a really interesting time that, you know, you had this these consultants that came in that were selling the traditional. I don't know. I don't want to say anything bad. Uh, just the traditional audience, right? On, sure. The old way of doing economic development. Top-down approach. The top down. Pick winners yeah. and losers. Exactly. And then you had this book and like this whole startup community thing. And we try, we're just like coming at it, like trying to, you know, knock the walls down. And yeah. it was just being met with resistance. Like I remember we had a session um, as part of this economic development thing about innovation and entrepreneurship. I approached the consultants early on and said, hey, we're, we've already got an organization. Like, can we get up and talk about what we're already doing? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get to the end of the hour session, didn't get a chance to get up. So like two of us were like, you know what, we're just gonna, as everybody's leaving, we're gonna get up, we're gonna plug in our computer and we're gonna run through what we're doing. Yeah. I think maybe a half dozen people stuck around to listen. Um, but we realized oh, this is gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge to, yeah. to get people on. How did you finally overcome that? Did you, I, I refer to it as MB marketing. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of the technique we've had to employ in Fort Worth because we had very similar, right. not, I, I wouldn't say that we had resistance. I would say that we had a lack of understanding of what we were trying to accomplish yes. and why. 
Yep. Uh, you know, people, you know, we have traditional institutions here in Fort Worth that were very similar to yours, mm -hmm. um, where they were, they didn't understand right. what we were trying to accomplish. And I just refer to it as MB marketing. Mm -hmm. You create something that's successful to a point where they don't have a choice, but they have to ask to be involved. Right. Right. Yep. Did you have a similar approach? Um, and, and how did that play out in your community? Yeah, I think we did. I think we just we just started doing stuff and kept doing stuff and made ourselves, you know, people were like, oh, that's, you know, they're doing things in this space. They're having events They're We hosted a couple startup weekends at Bradley University at our private university. So people had to take notice. That yeah, there was stuff going on. We were continuously branding. We're getting our name out there. I will say, though, it's interesting. The one thing that provided the most resistance to what we were doing in our area was a failed startup. Oh, interesting. That, that a lot of money was invested into by the traditional, you know, older community, and they were very, very risk averse. So there was a company that was spun out of Caterpillar that was a battery technology company. A lot of people dumped a lot of money into it, um, and then they went bankrupt, yeah. right? So that just left, it was only one experience, right? But that one experience left a really that bad taste. That set you back years. It did, and it left a bad taste in investors' mouths, in the community's mouths, just in terms of like, oh, well, this stuff's too risky for us. Yeah. We don't want to do this. But trying to convince them and get people to understand too that you know the way to do this the best is multiple small investments and lots of companies so you're not putting all your eggs and you know you're not putting seven or eight figures into one yeah. basket like diversify that risk that type of thing so that was an obstacle that we always were trying to you know overcome and i think it still exists today yeah um it's it's starting to change there have been some successes that you know people are start oh this you know this is how it really works and right. they're successful and they you know continue to hire people but yeah that was a really that was tough yeah it's hard it, it's really hard to overcome that the press that finance gets around startups right even though less than two percent of startups actually get capital from outside mm -hmm. um, they get all the news so every mm -hmm. startup thinks they need capital and every startup community thinks they need investment to make a startup community right which is a big barrier, right? Like we can't do anything until we get investors, yep. you know, and um, it couldn't be farther from the truth, That's, right? Yep. You probably had a lot of entrepreneurs that were local entrepreneurs doing great things in their community, main street businesses or side yep. hustles that were doing great things for their community, right? They hired a couple of people, they built successful businesses, they were keeping the wealth within Peoria mm -hmm. instead of, you know, supplying it to chains. Did you have a lot of wins in that area, or did you feel like that those stories kind of fell on deaf ears? I think we, at least we as an organization, Startup Peoria, tried, I, we pushed as hard as we could to get those stories out there. Because yeah. that was one of the big things that we were focused on, and, and later on when I started the Innovation Peoria Innovation Alliance was storytelling. Was if the local press isn't gonna give them, you know, awareness or recognition somebody has to yeah so we that's kind of what we did is kind of became a, a PR machine for I mean my company we were pretty self-funded we had a I mean a fifty thousand dollar investor but that was it and then we grew from two to thirty five people in a couple of years and did three million in revenue so we we were blowing up so yeah. we made sure to put our word out there right uh, there was another a friend of mine that I know started coming to our stuff um, got involved early on, we became good friends, and he and his wife left her job at CAT, and now they have the number one pregnancy subscription box on the market called Bump Boxes that was located there. So there were a, bunch, there were a lot of those, but early on, I think the problem was people wouldn't take them seriously. Yeah. They're like, you know, this is just some little, you know. Little person. Little tech thing, this, yeah, 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 that type of stuff. So we continually, I think with the channels we ran into, which was interesting is, like because it was on the national level with Trey and some of the others and Cameron around Startup America and Startup Champions, we were able to blast that stuff out there. So I'd go somewhere and I'd, oh, Peoria, we've heard about this company or yeah. what's going on there. But then even within our own community, people didn't know. Right. Like they never heard of the company or didn't know what they did or like didn't know that there was all this stuff going and on. And it's a small town. It is a small town. Yeah. Yeah. And people still didn't know. Yeah. And I think, and nothing, I mean, I mean, the journalism side of things, papers and stuff like that, they've gone through so many transitions. Yeah. 
that's what everybody read, but they never really did any stories. Well, and let's face it, I'm sorry, nobody gets the paper and immediately flips over to the business section. Right. I mean, it's a snooze fest, yeah. right? So and they got you know, the it's hard section. to compete against some of the other topics yeah. out there. Exactly. I totally get it. You know, we've got to find a way to make this stuff a little more palatable for consumption, right? Yep. So yep. startup sure. funerals is a way. I like we, that. We love yeah. the startup funerals from GW this year. We think that's a fun way to do it. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that first success, something where you put your stake in the ground and you said, see, it can be done here in Peoria. Um, I think, oh gosh, I think probably Bump Boxes was the first one. Other than, I mean, in what year? That would have been 20... 15, 2016. So you're at it like four years. Yeah, we were at it for a while. Strong. I mean, okay. we were building, so we we're building, I was building my company, but then I kind of go back a little bit, like the nonprofit Startup Pure, we ran out of money, right? I mean, yeah. 150,000 can only take you so far. We stretched it, I mean, we stretched it really far. Yep. We hired, you know, two people to run the co working space and do programming. Um, and then, yeah, the money like starts to dwindle. Well, then, like, even my company, we subsidized that and paid for an employee to keep going. Yep. And then, from an organizational standpoint, uh, we had a really visionary leader at our EDC at the time who had come from Iowa City. So they were kind of moving ahead. Yeah. Right? Because there were a couple. But really, similar sized town. Yeah. Right. But they had a I university. Mean, similar situation, yeah. Yeah. And they had some really like strong. Andy Stoll and Amanda West were like pioneers in ecosystem building. Yeah. Andy's now at Kaufman. Um, so she had seen the success of it and knew how it was important. So the EDC ended up taking Startup Pura underneath their umbrella. And then we had a, a written agreement that we'd review the relationship every other couple of years, whatever. And then I became a member of the board so I could kind of still oversee it. But yeah. so the financial burden was gone. You know, they maintained the employee, they maintained the co working space, all that kind of stuff. So that, I guess that was, it was a win that. It signified that this was legitimate. It was a real thing. Yeah. It had, you know, a budget and a building and programs and all that kind of stuff. So from the ecosystem building side, that was a win. And then on the company side, it was yeah. it was bump boxes of, um, you know, they've got a real thing. They're building, they built an e-commerce platform. Did they come out of your program and your building or were they just around the community they were around the community okay. um leland the the co-founder and his wife so leland and i were part of like a, a you know a forum group that we would meet regularly talk about not just business stuff but personal stuff like we became really close yeah. friends um and yeah he was actively involved in all the different we didn't have any like educational like come to this well i take that back we did have some classes those types of things but no like structured program, you right. know, go through this, come do the business model canvas, all that type of thing. But, um, so I can't say we were fully responsible for that, but I think in terms of the community that was around them, yeah. we helped, you know, kind of build that. So, and they're still going strong. They, um, Paul Singh from uh, um, 500 Startups and Results Junkies, he did this um, Airstream tour across the US, yeah. stopped in Peoria, met them. He's now their chief revenue officer. Oh, nice. He yeah. flies to Peoria, you know, twice a month, and they're now like just, blowing up. I mean, yeah. they've, they've absolutely crushed the market and are, are doing a really good job. So it's cool to see them succeed. There's another startup. Is the uh, whole town like rallying around this business or is it still kind of on the lowdown? It's still kind of on the lowdown. Yeah. And that's been like, in my discussions with him, that's been his frustration, right? Yeah. Of like, they're employing X amount of people growing X amount year over year. And yet like they don't get the attention that, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you would think that the attention is Caterpillar just signed a new supplier. Right? right. Yeah. Or, you know, they're, they're needing a new building, you know, yeah. well, we're going to charge you full market rate, you know, no, no consideration for yeah. you're providing a bunch of jobs. You guys are going to blow up. I mean, you're growing, you're, you know, and no. they're, they're like, okay, well maybe we'll go to Chicago yeah. or some or other, another or state. Some other place. And I know exactly they've right. been, I know they've been courted by other states, Sure. but you know, when your people are there and that kind of stuff, you yeah. have a, you have a loyalty and stuff. So. I know, they're not going anywhere, but it's just been, it was frustrating to see, like, they're creating all this interest, all these jobs, um, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And it's like, not taking you seriously because yeah. you don't wear a suit to work every day type of thing. <laughs>